record button. Great. All right, we are good to go. Great. Well, I know that's that's fine, Nick. We had a little bit of a technology glitch where we had to switch the uh, the invite. So I know we have a few people still coming on to join us. Um, but I would just like to welcome everybody. Just a good afternoon. And we are so happy to have you join us today. I'd like to thank you for your time and willingness to be part of the um, CEC on track, uh, ninth grade on track work group. Dusty, I'll have you just click on the next slide. Uh, my name is Jan Sellers. I am, I work at KDE. I'm in the Office of Teaching and Learning and my role is uh, MTSS or Multi-Tiered System of Supports Coordinator. Um, I'm joined today with my co-facilitator, Destiny O'Rourke. Um, she is from the Council on Post-Secondary Education. She's the director of the Kentucky Advising Academy. And we also have with us today, um, Dr. Jennifer Fraker from the Council of Post-Secondary Education. We have Dee Dee Connor from KDE. She's in our Office of Educational Technology and Janae Chandler, who was one of our external partners um, from the Educational Strategies Work Group. So we'd like to take just a minute and um, have you guys give yourself a chance to introduce yourselves in the chat. So if you would please type your name, your organization, and go ahead and tell us whether you prefer the beach or the mountains as you consider that time off that you might be taking this summer, um, if that much needed time off, I think. Um, so if you go ahead, just put that, pop that in the chat and we'll get a chance to see who is with us um, in the work group today. Hi Lou, nice to see you. And we are happy to have you with us. I love the beach too. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> a lot of be lot of beach people with us today. Dee Dee, I think you are too. I always think about the pictures I've seen <laughs> on your, yeah, uh, your absolutely. Screen. I just actually got back from the beach Saturday, so I'm ready to go back. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I can use it. Something about that sound of the waves just kind of can just be very, 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 very calming. Absolutely. Well, as we look at today's agenda, what we'd like to do today is give you an overview of the Commonwealth Educational Continuum. We're going to review some um, specific Kentucky data as it pertains to our work group. We'll talk to you a little bit about the proposed roles and expectations of the group, and we'll also um, talk about a um, stakeholder engagement effort that we'd like to, to implement. And then we also have some next steps as far as next meeting dates um, and um, actions from that. All right, so I just want to take a moment and um, read our objectives. So we want to make sure that we understand the goals and priorities of the work group and how they tie into the broader efforts of the Commonwealth Education Continuum, level set on the roles and expectations of the work group members, review and discuss state level data on ninth grade student success to begin to identify key gaps and opportunities to address through this work and begin to plan for conducting interviews and focus groups with key stakeholders. So we're gonna to begin today with just a brief overview of the Commonwealth Education Continuum. And I will turn that over to Dr. Jennifer Franker for that. Great, right. thanks Destiny and thanks Jan. So before I begin, just know I am a social studies teacher at heart. So I admit it. I may nerd rage just a little bit when given the opportunity to provide any type of historical context. So if you will, just give me a little latitude. I promise to be brief, but I really wanna make sure that I give you some insight on the development of the continuum, which was really formally established in 2020, but really the product of years of ongoing conversations. So with that, let's take us back nearly a decade ago uh, when Kentucky's educational leaders gathered around the Capitol to sign the Commonwealth Commitment, which was a pledge to work together across our P20 system to ensure seamless student transitions from one level to the next. However, as you all know, here we are today and the need for this group continues, especially considering some of the data. And keep in mind, you'll note that the use of data really throughout our conversations today is gonna play an important role. 
So here's some things that we knew when we began the continuum and, and we still kind of know today that only half of Kentucky's children exhibit readiness for kindergarten, which means they are not ready to succeed in and benefit from early learning experiences that set the stage for future success. We also know that according to the National Assessment of Educational Progress or NAEP, 40% of Kentuckians uh, fourth graders are proficient in mathematics, but by middle school, that percentage falls to 29%. Kentucky's in-state college going rate is just 51.7% down from 55% and significantly below the national average of 70%. And last but not least, the number of Kentucky students earning a degree continues to decline along with the national um, average median salary for those who do not earn a credential or degree. Jennifer, I don't yeah. know if, you, I think your slides aren't advancing with you. Oh. Ours still says stakeholder engagement. Okay, it, uh, oh, that's, go that's back. right. Yeah, here we go. Go back one more. I'm still there. See, I told you, just bear with me. I have like all this history to share, Dr. <laughs> Young. Okay, thanks. Thanks for getting us back on track. Okay, so um, let's see. So keeping those things at the forefront of their minds, uh, the Continuum's co-chairs, those being Lieutenant Governor Jacqueline Coleman, uh, Kentucky Council on Post-Secondary Education President Aaron Thompson, and Kentucky Education Commissioner Jason Glass, they all came together with a common commitment to take action to ensure Kentucky students' educational experiences provide an equitable opportunity to prepare them for the transition from P-12 all the way through to the workforce. So it's a mouthful. So from this commitment in December, 2020, the continuum was formed out of this moral imperative to strengthen the pipeline. So a press conference began with Kentucky Governor Andy Bashir. And the co-chairs launched the announcement of the continuum with each of the three agencies subsequently adopting a board resolution in support of the commitment to seek solutions to assist students as they transition through the state's public aid education system. So thank you, Dr. Young, for your work on the Kentucky Board of Education. In essence, though, uh, the continuum really started as and still provides a forum for Kentucky's P-12 and post-secondary education systems to work collaboratively to further understand the diverse needs of the state and seek actions to improve Kentucky's education system. Just know the structure of the continuum was designed to, to support the collaborative body in achieving its desired outcomes. So as such, the continuum consisted of and still consists today of a main body, the continuum, and then the work groups tasked with reviewing information and making recommendations to go before that main body of the continuum. The continuum itself then led by those co-chairs I mentioned previously, they consist of, it consists of 28 members whose expertise ranges from early childhood to the workforce. All right, so fast forward just a little bit to its initial meeting in January of last year. Continuum members focused the work of the continuum around an annual objective to develop and execute a specific plan to activate the biggest levers for increasing successful student transition in a post-secondary. The continuum members met quarterly then to hone in on how to accomplish the annual objective. It was at that beginning meeting, the continuum based on that preliminary data walk that they had in the meeting saw the need for and created three work groups with distinct focus areas in order to, in order to further understand the diverse needs uh, of the state and to seek actions to improve Kentucky's education system. So those initial work groups, those three, there were three, were focused on exploring Number one, early post-secondary opportunities. Number two, educator workforce and diversity. And number three, student successful transition to post-secondary. So these work groups then were co-chaired by the following leaders. Um, early post-secondary opportunities being Kentucky Commissioner Jason Glass and KCTCS President Paul Zarapata. Educator workforce and diversity being Lieutenant Governor Jacqueline Coleman and Western Kentucky University College of Education, Dean Corinne Murphy, and then successful transition to post-secondary, which was CPE President Aaron Thompson and Kentucky Board of Education Chair, Lou Young. So as these work groups then began to meet, they highlighted the need for more data and more personalized context. So to elevate the voices of the communities that would be most impacted of the work of the continuum, getting really deep into it. Education Strategy Group, or ESG, thanks Danae, 
in collaboration with CPE, held a series of interviews and focus groups with various stakeholders from across the state. We did these in coordination with the eight regional cooperatives to ensure economic, racial, and geographic diversity. The questions then of these focus groups really centered on the three work group areas. All in all, we had a total of 166 individuals participating in the interviews and focus groups, that being 120 from the K-12 sector and 46 from higher ed. So with all this data, the work groups then used this to inform their conversations. And then ultimately what came from the work groups was a set of recommendations and suggested actions for the continuum to consider. This is really where our work then begins and why you're here today serving this important role meaning that it's, in, uh, it's time to get in the weeds of those recommendations and really move forward. So to do that, the continuum also realized earlier this year that we needed even more data to inform our efforts. So enter the creation of a data team that will be front and center during all of our conversations this year. So now with that, I think it's time to talk about the data team, but before I turn it over to Dee Dee Connor, AKA the data queen, I would be remiss if I didn't give Dr. Young the opportunity, sorry, Dr. Young, I'm putting you on the spot, to talk about or share anything over the events of the last year. Dr. Young, of course, served on the committee uh, or on the continuum, but also on one of the work groups. So Dr. Young. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Frager. Um, I told them in the chat when you got started on the retrospective to fasten their seatbelts. Um, <laughs> in all seriousness, it was lovely to hear um, the retrospective because it's such a great reminder about um, the pomp and circumstance at the time that the group was formed um, and then the hard work that happened and then what I love so much is that the process has been uh, committed to uh, the iterative work that unfolds as we bring great thinkers together um, and great partners together so looking at those represented today uh, number one thank you so much for the gift of your time uh, to the project, but especially for your perspective and expertise. Um, it is highly valued in this process and I'm thrilled to be a part of it. Thanks, so true, so well said as always, such great insight. We truly are thankful. This is great work and we are so thankful to have you. So with that, I will be quiet. Dee, Dee I, I will turn it over to you to talk about data. All right, I'm gonna bear with me as I share my screen. See, I told everybody I was better at team as I am it. Uh, there you go. Can let me know when you can see it. Oh. All right. See it. We've got it. Okay, perfect. All right. So my name is Dee Dee Connor. I do work with the uh, Department of uh, uh, Kentucky Department of Education, like uh, Jennifer said. I am. Um, called Chief Data Officer, but that's like a grandiose title. I don't know how I got that, but. Data uh, Queen. <laughs> so it is uh, something that we do support, uh, a lot of data collections and, and data reporting uh, as part of our work. And most of this data that we're looking at today uh, did come from the Kentucky Department of Education, but I will say, uh, uh, accolades go to Kentucky Stats because they really provided all the data. We're very fortunate in Kentucky to have a strong longitudinal data system and they're great uh, managers of that system. And I think we have Beth here today with us from that group. So glad to have uh, everybody there. So I just want to uh, you know, say a little bit about the data team, uh, the con uh, continuum data team. It was launched earlier this year. Um, it is made rep a representation of KDE. Um, CPE and Kentucky Stats. We do meet monthly and we kind of reflect on the things that have come up in conversations. Um, we look at the data um, related to the continuum's focus areas uh, for this year. We're doing similar presentations in all of our work groups today. And if you have any lingering questions after today, we will have a Q&A period. Uh, we'll be able to pull some additional data for future work group meetings. Uh, the goal today is to give us an overview of the current state of the ninth grade on track in Kentucky. All right. Give me a minute as I work through. Uh, I'm not as expert on this Google. Okay, so when you talk about ninth grade on track, you think, what is that? So, you know, we want to start, start by going over what we mean by ninth grade on track. 
it's a, it's a measure uh, that some states use as part of their high school and even their middle school accountability systems. Many districts across the state, um, or across the country, I should say, also monitor ninth grade on track metrics. The way districts and states define uh, ninth grade on track varies. It is usually uh, considered credits earned and sometimes grades. Uh, for example, um, Illinois, ninth graders on track if they earn at least five full year course credits and have earned no more than one F in a course. So uh, your English, math, social studies, and science classes are looked at. In Oregon, uh, students are on track if they earn at least 25% of the credit needed to graduate with a regular high school diploma uh, by the beginning of their sophomore year. And in Washington, it's uh, simply defined as students earning all credits they attempted in their ninth grade year. So we're going to present some data on ninth grade GPA and completion. Ninth grade GPA is particularly important because not only does it indicate whether a student will graduate, it also is a predictive measure whether they will enter uh, into post-secondary enrollment and succeed. So, let me see. I don't know why, okay. While we um, didn't have the data on ninth grade outcomes that we could tie to longer term outcomes for a cohort, we were able to pull information on students' academic preparedness as they left eighth grade enter and entering ninth grade. This graph looks at the 2011 to 2012 eighth graders, high school class of 2016, who scored proficient or distinguished on their KPREP. And remember, when we're looking at data, you think, oh, that's a long time ago. It, it takes a while to look at the data to longitudinally to get them out of you know, the post-secondary schools too. So uh, the blue bars are students who were proficient in both math and English. Uh, the orange bars are students who were proficient in math or English. And the gray bars are students who did not score proficient in math or English. We see that students that left eighth grade proficient in math and early English were more likely to graduate high school on time, earn a 3.0 plus GPA and enroll in post-secondary and earn a post-secondary degree or credential. 35% of students who scored proficient on math and English had earned a post-secondary degree or credential compared to only 9% of students who did not earn a proficient score in math or English. So academic preparedness as students enter ninth grade can impact students' long-term outcomes. So the next thing uh, we wanted to look at is whether disparities existed for students who left eighth grade with a similar level of academic preparedness. These graphs look at students who, prepared, who scored proficient or higher on both math and English eighth grade K-PREP. These students are hypothetically uh, entering high school with the same level of academic preparedness Yet we still see disparities in outcomes for students on free and reduced lunch uh, and black and Hispanic students. In the graph on the left, students on paid lunch outperformed students on free and reduced price lunch on all the outcomes we considered. The only exception was earning a CTE industry certificate, which free and reduced price lunch students earned at a slightly higher rate. In the graph on the right, we see the higher percentage of white students achieved each of the outcomes uh, than black or Hispanic students. Again, these are measures of uh, as students entered high school with the same level of academic preparedness, but re regardless, we're seeing that outcomes do vary. So as we look at this, are there any questions or thoughts on this, but you know, looking at the data, both uh, for proficients and, um, students and how well they're doing in high school and on where we move on all right we do have questions at the end so so a ninth grade sample uh, you know we pulled that um, for the data we were about to share we looked at all first time kentucky public ninth grade students in the 2016 and 17 through 2020 21 school years this provides us with some data that shows the impact of the pandemic, as well as the idea of how the state was performing before the pandemic. GPAs and credit hours attempted and earned include only the student's ninth grade year. So the first big takeaway is that ninth grade success was improving slightly before the pandemic, but it declined for students who 
began ninth grade in the fall of 2020. On the left, we have an average ninth grade GPA, which had just broken 3.0 in the 2019-2020 school year, but then dropped nearly 0.4 points for the 2021 uh, freshmen. The graph on the right, uh, the percentage of students earning a 3.0 or higher in blue, and the percentage of students passing all credits attempted in red, even before the pandemic, the percentage of students with 3.0 GPA or higher hovered just, hover just over 50%. And the percentage of students earning all credits attempted Hover just above 70%. These percentages dropped by 13 points for 3.0 plus grad GPAs and by 15 points for passing all credits attempted during the 2021 school year. These are graphs are important. They show the impact of the pandemic, but they also show that as we transition through the pandemic, um, that in before the pandemic, um, the, where we've been. The state had room for improvement regardless. So the percentage of students earning a 3.0 GPA or higher also varied by race ethnicity. Black students are 23 points less likely to earn a 3.0 than white students. Hispanic students are 12 points uh, less likely to earn a 3.0 than white students. Asian students, although a smaller group, are earning 3.0 GPAs at higher rates than their peers. Next, we wanna look at whether the percentage of students earning a 3.0 GPA varies by student demographics. We see that students on the free and reduced price lunch are 30 points less likely to earn a 3.0 than their peers on paid lunch. Male students are nearly 20 points less likely to earn 3.0 than female students. Although not as drastic, rural students are somewhat more likely to earn a 3.0 GPA than urban students. And as we might expect, students in gifted and talented are earning a 3.0 GPA at a higher rate than their peers. Special education students have the lowest rate of earnings 3.0 GPAs and just over a third of the limited English proficiency students earn a 3.0 GPA. Although higher and less variable than the percentage of students earning a 3.0 uh, plus GPA, the students of the, the percentage of students passing all credits attempted also varies by student characteristics. There's a 20 point difference between students on free and reduced price lunch and those with paid lunch. There's a nearly a 10 point difference between male and female students. Students with limited English and special education students also had lower rates of earning all credits attempted. You see similar differences also existed by race ethnicity, by students passing all credits attempted. Black students were about eight points less likely to pass all of their classes than white students. Students who were two or more races also had lower levels of passing all credits attempted. Across the years, um, Black limited English proficiency, special education, and free and reduced price lunch students were less likely to earn all credits attempted. A particular note is that Black students had the lowest rate of earning all credits. And at this point, kind of take a look at this graph because it's very, you know, it, it's very interesting to see how low the Black students even are below the special education LAP, uh, limited English proficiency students. So that was a lot of data to throw at you. And um, now we're gonna ask you some questions. And um, if you can, we'll drop the chat questions in the chat and I'll stop screen sharing so that we can all look at the chat and have some um, input and questions and uh, just some comments even about the data we've shared. Well, thank you, Didi. Uh, a question that comes to mind, and I feel certain I could, with your help, drill this down, but what troubles me a lot about what I see is that if we were to look at a profiled fictitious student who was male, Black, eligible for free and reduced price lunch, and had a disability, 
um, then I think we would see appalling, dismal um, numbers there. Yes. And that's a good point because what the numbers we're looking at, there is some overlap. You might be black and you also might be special education and all that. We don't have all that distinguished. But yes, if you have a lot of those same factors, I would say you're probably right. Lou, you bring up something that's really good to think about as this group works on what ninth grade on track looks like in Kentucky, right? Like, mm -hmm. how do you want to be intentional about the intersectionalities of race, income, um, and all of the other uh, components that you know um, can really hinder and create barriers for students? So that is something to think about as you all progress um, in this work throughout the year, um, because the measure for on track doesn't just have to be those um, two elements oh. that DD presented on, right? We have, we have some states who are using like attendance and engagement and um, various things. And so as you, as this work group works um, throughout this year, just think about some other indicators that you might, that might help capture that intersectionality that you're describing. Mm -hmm. One last quick comment, I'm, I apologize. Um, I did some work with the uh, United Way of the Bluegrass a few years ago, and we also looked at some things that we had called success markers at the time, um, but something for the school level folks to think about. Um, we looked at um, ninth graders who were taking Algebra One compared to those who had already taken Algebra One. Ninth graders who were in orchestra, for example, ninth graders who were in a higher than Spanish one or French one, for example. So some of the course taking patterns that have implications for the way students cohort through their high school experience. Um, we were just looking at Fayette County data at the time, but it was pretty revealing. I'll mention that Kentucky doesn't have a ninth grade on track measure but um, districts do have a early warning system tool within Infinite Campus that provides a lot of this information. It goes further than what we've looked at today because it does include your behavior, attendance, your uh, race, ethnicity, you know, a lot, and, and it varies based on school. So, cause it's been, it's, you know, we've had about 10 years of data to look at. So it is predictive in that way. So, you know, there are some, um, you know, tools available to districts that includes some of this information, but it's not termed the same way as ninth grade on track or anything like that. I think we saw, I see Susan's got a fire alarm. We definitely want her to get out of the building, right? Any other questions? You know, what questions do you have about the data? Are there other questions that come up, you know, around this data that make you think, well, did you look at this? There's a question in the chat that says, I'm curious about what information we have about grades that are typically assigned in Kentucky, traditional versus standards based. I will say looking at grades in Kentucky is, you know, grading is very much a local decision. So there's a lot of variances throughout the state. Um, there's, you know, and you're right, some, you know, are standards based, others aren't. Uh, some within the district depends on what, you know, level you are at, whether you're standard based or not, but. Judy, is there any way in Infinite Campus that you all are able to see how many districts use standard-based grading? Yes, we can see that. I wonder if that's helpful. That might be something to flag just as in our notes. Yeah. Just we can, honestly. We can look at that. I think a lot, it, a lot of it will be hard to tell because I think some of them are doing that in learning management systems. That's true. A lot of them use uh, Google Classroom, which is, does not, doesn't provide standards base. Infinite Campus has a full suite that does allow for that but it can get a little clunky when you're trying to use another system and then infinite campus. Yeah. So, um, you know, it, even numbers that we pull mm -hmm. might not reflect, be accurate because there could be other things being done that we can't see through that one system. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I don't know necessarily a question, but um, you know, just 
look at those uh, male female differences there. And, and you know, I noticed that in, in our school, we, we we don't have a lot of uh, of racial diversity here. We also don't have a lot of economic diversity. You know, we're about eighty five percent free and reduced. Uh, but I see, uh, you know, there's a huge difference between our male population and our female population in, in performance and, uh, you know, uh, identified for special education services. Uh, you know, uh, it's a lot astounding to me how many how many more boys we have that, that are um, identified for special education services than, than females. And I, like I said, that not really a, a, a question involved there, but just kind of a, yeah, that backs up what I'm seeing um, here at our school. Good input. Um, to kind of piggyback off that, um, I've been having this conversation. The, the data wasn't alarming because that's been the trend for a while now that I've seen. Um, and just um, thinking about how can we keep our students engaged in school and not just academic engagement, but like there has to be something else to draw them there, to keep them there and engage, especially our males, especially our males of color. And so down here in my area, South Central Kentucky, um, Franklin, Bowling Green area, we're seeing, we're, we're doing a lot of mentorship programs. Um, so going into the schools and then having them outside of the school, trying to help um, our students of color, particularly our males, just see the importance of school and just engaging them in a different way, uh, just to try to maybe improve upon them passing their courses or even um, encouraging them to take harder courses, you know, not just the gen ed courses, you know, trying to raise the expectations for them. So um, that is actually something that has really been a conversation I've had with several people just in my area. Just we've got to look at a different way to keep our kids engaged because what we're doing now is not necessarily working. So in particular, our students of color. So like this is something I've, I'm really like interested in. And so I'm glad this is a conversation we're having. That kind of takes us to the next question. I think you kind of transitioned well because you said, you know, what surprised you about the day? It doesn't sound like this surprised you. This is what you're seeing still. I mean, so we, we don't want to discount the data because it's students that were 11, 12 year old, you know, back from 11, 12, we're still seeing these same behaviors. I think is a very important, um, you know, note to make and thank you. And I would say that I see the same data or similar trends with very young children in my setting. Okay. How are you all using some of this similar type of data that's available, you know, publicly, you know, with school report card, anything like that? Is that helpful? It doesn't go so far as to take it into the post-secondary environment or anything like that, but is that data um, used to, you know, towards change locally? Since it's a data team, I'm going rogue here and asking a, asking that question. <laughs> well, from my experience, so I have a unique viewpoint because I worked at KDE for four years in the Office of Continuous Improvement and Support. I was one of the novice reduction coaches. So we were really big on looking at the data and then using it to come up with your improvement plan. Um, and so I think from my experience now going back into a district, I think it just depends on how people view um, planning and implementing the plan and using the plan and if they really know how to look at the data and to determine what to do. Um, I mean, I legit had a school district look at me one time when I was in my role at KD and say, well, what do I do about the black kids? I was like, well, <laughs> Nora, I'm going to piggyback on what you're saying, because I was kind of making those same connections. I think as we're, as our work group is looking toward, you know, how we want to define ninth grade on track or, or looking at that intersectionality, um, I think it's also a piece of the puzzle to kind of think about how we move from just looking at data and how we can analyze it to make effective decisions. Um, mm -hmm. So provide what supports might need to be in place to, um, help our schools and districts move from just analyzing 
um, big picture data to be able to dig down, but also some problem solving steps to kind of actually get to some action planning. So that may be something, again, as we work through our, our months of, of meetings, we want to kind of keep in, keep in mind or think about what that might look like. Oh, most definitely. I think that's, I think you hit it. They, they don't always know how to do that. And I think that's something if they had people in play in some places do, you know, if they didn't know how to do that, I think you see better results, but I don't think it's consistent across the state. Anything that, any additional questions you have, you know, after seeing this data? That's you know, one of the things that I kind of, I can't help but think about is just, you know, when we're trying to engage students and keep them focused and get them on track, so much of um, college and career readiness work ties into this, you know, and, and, and you know, what, how do we keep them motivated? Maybe there's a way that language can include talking about their future because I think a lot of times if they don't understand how their work right now truly affects the options they have or the options they become limited it's hard for them to really conceptualize why ninth grade year matters so much and 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 how that really does put them on track for success you know I, I had so many students in the past who sat across that desk from me as seniors and they said I wish I had known how important my grades were. You know, the, there, there were always three things. Their grades, they wish they had gotten more involved and they wish they didn't care what other people thought about them so much. And so I just, I feel like this conversation, you know, when we're thinking about that individual kid across the desk who has all this unlimited potential when they're first starting out, you know, how do we have conversation with them about what their future could look like and how to unlock their strengths and how those strengths and interests play together for career opportunities. And then how education plays a role in getting them to that career opportunity. Yeah, and, and you know, I know we're looking at ninth grade on track, but it really tells us something about the importance of being on track, you know, through elementary middle school to and showing how success, much more successful those students are once they enter ninth grade, having been, you know, meeting, uh, you know, expectations and meet, being on track at that point in time, I think. Well, and to see the things we're looking at, right, we're looking at English and we're looking at math and we're looking at GPA, you know, I just can't help but think if I were in a school right now, I'd be I'd have signs 3.0 way to go you know what I mean this is how you this is how you go you know because when we're when we can tie you know I'm thinking about even the 15 to finish campaign you know over these years people know that now they know that if I want to graduate in four years from college I need to take at least 15 credit hours so I'm thinking about this idea of this 3.0 GPA you know somehow playing into how we're defining what might fit on track looks like and how we build a, a communication campaign around that even. Anybody else? There's a comment in the chat. I'm sorry, Didi, I'm just gonna be reading comments out loud. Oh, please do, please do. I missed one, absolutely. It's all good. That's why we're a team, we're a team. Um, tag teaming. Um, diving into the data really pushes me to, to root causes related to unmet transitional needs, engagement, attendance, exclusionary discipline, course taking patterns, etc. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and that, that, and we're fortunate to have that data available, you know, some of that data, because there's not statewide, you know, the data that has more of a statewide standards, it's much easier to look at than the data that has uh, is, you know, district by district, they do their own things and they're doing it because that's right for their students. I'm not second guessing anything that's being done, but it just makes it a lot difficult from the data aspect to look at that data statewide. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and, and that's where you get into course taking patterns. You know, you got districts that have five courses, you know, during the day and you got districts that have 14. You know, it, it's just, 
you know, you got, you know, quarters, trimesters, you know, semesters and anything in between. And it, it's really sometimes hard for a, from a technology standpoint to look at that data, but, you know, we can dig, and, you know, because we have that data and try to make some sense out of it. And, you know, we don't want to not look at it just because it's a little difficult or that's different. You know, if we can see some similar, some similarities that are there and look at those, they'll tell us a lot, but we, you know, we just kind of need that guiding you know, what, what to look at next, how to align the data. A lot of that data that's listed there is available. I mean, you know, but it's available as a silo, the discipline data, the attendance date, you know, the, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's almost looked at silos. And I think there's a lot of benefit. Uh, and, you know, maybe we need to dig into the early warning system a little bit more because that's where it pulls it all together. It doesn't pull it all together in some of the other data visualizations, um, you know, that we have. But I was curious, and part of me uh, wanted to be part of this group because I was thinking if they figure this out, what night great on track is, I'm going to create a data visualization. And, make, and next thing I know, I'm speaking today. So, <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, it is something that, you know, we're there, you know, if there's metrics that we can use to benefit folks and we can really get that information out there and share it, you know. That's you know, a piece of the puzzle. It's not the, you know, it's not what's going to fix everything and it's not going to complete anything, but it does allow us to promote, you know, some of the stuff we're seeing uh, locally to help schools and districts, because we do have, you know, tools, we've got Tableau, we've got the early warning system, you know, we're going to open up uh, infinite campus data analytics um, soon for all districts that, uh, using some of our ESSER money. So we do have data that's available. We've got to make sure people know how to use it. And we got to make sure it's it's showing what we want them to show. So, you know, the input you all can provide in, in this type of discussion can really help from a KDE standpoint. You know, provide more data too. I agree, Dee Dee, and I think that kind of is a nice segue into kind of the rest. But I'm also thinking, and again, from that lens of you know we we've got the capacity and we can build some good data systems or. We have, like you said, the data out there in silos. And so I'm going to kind of bring it back to that concept of what is the organizational structure that can bring coherence to all those pieces and, and helping, you know, build that, promote that system um, of continuous improvement that will guide that work, whether it's an MTSS model, um, continuous improvement model. So we have structured teams and systems in place at district and school levels where they can bring all those pieces together. And so I think the work of this team is defining and kind of uh, seeing what we think is important um, can maybe kind of help us uh, build supports for our districts and schools. Well, having said that, Jan, I think what I'm gonna do is transition a little bit more. Uh, let me pop our presentation back up here. Okay, so I, we'll take some time now to dig a little deeper into the purpose of our work group and your important role in it. Um, so the purpose of ninth grade on track work group is to contribute to students readiness for post secondary options and success beginning in early grades, especially as you all can see from the data um, for Kentucky's underrepresented students. And so this work will be informed by current data and continuous input from focus groups and from our CEC members. Okay, so what you see now uh, on the screen, there are some questions for our work group that we are gonna need to explore together. So what I'd like for you to do is take a moment and use your annotate feature. So if you've not done that before, when you scroll to the top of your screen and that menu pops down, you're gonna see the word annotate. It's got a little pencil uh, looking logo on it. And when you click on annotate, it brings up a toolbar. Uh, and on that toolbar, there's a stamp feature. So if you, you just click on that stamp feature and you can choose whichever icon you want, I want you to take a moment to look over these different questions and then just put a stamp in the question you feel like um, is the most pressing or the most important for Kentucky to address. So um, go ahead and take a moment to do that. And as we're thinking through these outcomes, you know, consider additional data or information that we will need in order to successfully address each of these questions. 
So, you know, as you're marking that and you're thinking about what extra data we might need, go ahead and just take a moment and type your ideas into the chat. So let's take a moment to do that. This is great, great feedback. And so, you know, um, continue as you're doing that, just remember if you have any, you know, thoughts on what data we might need to support the, the question that you felt like was the most important, um, certainly feel free to type that into the chat. And, you know, yes, we're having this time together now, but also remember, you know, you will be able to reach us anytime you have some thoughts about ninth grade on track. And so um, towards the end, we will also be giving our information to you so that um, you have some a way to connect with us if you think of other things between our meetings. It looks like Yes, looks like we've got several um, responses back. So, so I'm going to give another few seconds here before I hit save so I can save all of our feedback. And in the chat, Destiny, doc, uh, Dr. Young mentions that even though this is suggestion is a heavy lift, she would love for us to conduct some focus groups with ninth graders to explore their thinking about their own success and that of peers. So, um, oh, that's kind of great feedback for sure. And, and, you know, we might be able to talk about ways to incorporate that in one of the asks that we have for our work group today. So that's mm -hmm. wonderful feedback. Okay, so please feel free just to keep adding things in the chat if you have ideas of other, I said, uh, other data. Suzanne Farmer mentions that it would be helpful to identify areas that have outlier data uh, or success so we can identify what they're doing differently. So as we're seeing those ones that are getting results, kind of maybe what's happening there. Um, okay. <laughs> you seen that comment? <laughs> I'm <laughs> reading Dr. Young's comment. Since you guys didn't run screaming from the room, we could think about youth participatory research where we train SSs, I'm not sure what that is, to conduct the focus group with their peer seniors, I guess, to conduct the students. Uh, students to conduct the focus group with their freshmen. It's Dr. Peers. Young, student voice. Come on, yeah, Jan. Yeah, <laughs> definitely getting that student voice in there. Okay, well, feel free right. to continue those suggestions at any point. Um, All right. Oh, you know what? Our beautiful markings stay with us. So let me hop back here and remove those. We're kind of new to the annotate feature ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Okay. All right. So then as we think about um, our roles as, uh, within the work group, really um, you guys as that team of practitioners, or those individuals with the expertise 
Related to students being on track for success in ninth grade, this work group will meet monthly um, to develop recommendations, implementation plans, key inputs or strategies, and viable policy proposals that we can present to the CEC in consideration of their efforts. So let's take a look at your role um, within the as a member of the work group. We really want to leverage your expertise to, to lift up those key programs and policies and initiatives that are working that will inform our work. We want to look at those bar policy barriers and opportunities to implementing the work group implementations. We want to, uh, recommendations. We want to continue the development of proposed work group deliverables and then um, have you serve as an advocate for the work group right, and around the CEC so that we can build that awareness and buy-in among those key stakeholders um, around the state. So to that end, we're just gonna ask each of you um, to commit to staying engaged, informed, and willing to participate as fully as possible. We know that your schedules are incredibly busy and we intend to give and receive grace as we work together. However, we would like for you to commit to attending the four remaining work group meetings um, that are scheduled for July, August, October, and November, and to conduct at least one stakeholder interview or focus group. And that's kind of what we were, we were getting at a little earlier in our conversations that would help inform our work um, and have those done by June the 30th. Okay, so let me explain what that looks like. So our first big ask of you as a work group member is to conduct at least one stakeholder interview or focus group by June 30th. And so really um, it's important for us, right? So having a wide range of respondents, it really gives our work such valuable information. Having vo the voice of Kentuckians on this Kentucky work is vital. Um, so we're gonna work through in just a second, a quick planning protocol together to ensure that we have diverse voices represented. So the interview or focus group that you conduct will last about 30 minutes and questions and documents to capture notes will be provided. So you don't have to worry about building any of that that will be provided. You'll have the questions and a tool to, to uh, capture the notes. So notes, quotes, and uh, all those things can be captured in that notes document that we'll provide for you. So we will ask that you send us the notes and the stakeholder information by June 30th. Okay, and so um, as we explore ninth grade on track, we, we really wanna hear from stakeholders like students, counselors, family members, administrators, teachers. So if uh, I'm just you know throwing this out there, you know what other stakeholder groups can you think of to add as you're thinking about that, feel free to add that in the chat. If there's a voice that really needs to be heard that we aren't looking at right now, please, by all means, um, you know, add that stakeholder group in there. And so I'm gonna go ahead and pull up this planning protocol that you can add into as you think of those other stakeholder groups. And Jan um, has placed that, that link in the chat. So if you'll go ahead and pull up this tool, then um, you will see that You've got your name listed over here, and then also there are these stakeholder types. So as you're thinking about who you have access to, you wanna make sure that you put that role group over in the stakeholder types. We are not asking for names. Please do not put names in, in there. Um, so again, you know, please just take a moment to consider which of our stakeholder groups that you have the most access to. Uh, and again, just in that box beside your name, type that group um, that you plan to engage for your interview or for your focus group. And by all means, you are welcome to do more than one. And so if you do um, a couple of those, or if you need some extra guidance on how to conduct that focus group, however, we can help pull in the voice of those you have the uh, best access to, we want to be uh, of service to you in that way. So we'll take just a few moments as you continue to populate uh, those role groups in. And after it slows down a bit, we'll move on.
I'm seeing a comment in the chat here from Didi saying former students for a reflective view would be a good group, um, but may already be included under students. And so, you know, keep in mind that wide variety of, of types of students uh, to interview. I want to see Frisk here. Yes, absolutely. Great partners. Okay. Well, it's looking like things are slowing down a bit. So uh, by all means, continue to type in and um, we will be sure to give you what you need in order to support you in these efforts. And we're so appreciative, again, understanding that you are incredibly busy and have a much deserved uh, summer break coming up here. So thank you for that. Um, we're appreciative that this plan is now taking shape. I did add the link back in the screen, Autumn. I hope that you saw that. You can access that at any time. Um, again, just type it in as you're thinking of, of who might you, you might be able to do. So. Um, and so, Jan, did I see there's a interview protocol that we use and we type into that form for each? Yes, and we'll be sending group. that. We'll be sending that out. Um, so, really, just um, again, want to thank you for your willingness to serve on this work group, be a member of this work. We'll go, we will be uploading um, information about the group's activities, including your names and affiliations on the CEC webpage. And you can find that information on CPE's website under our work and the Commonwealth Education Continuum. We'll actually put that link to that page on the, um, in the chat. <clears throat> but as a way to keep us um, all organized and on track, we will give you access to a Google folder with notes from today and um, all the other important documents that will help in our work. You'll get a follow-up email with all the details and resources to conduct the interview um, uh, or your focus group. And then we'll also double check to make sure you have our next meeting dates <laughs> on our calendar. Um, just check and see if you've got those. We should have sent out Zoom links for those. Um, so um, if we haven't already, Joette will send out those Zoom links for you to hold those dates on your calendar. So I know we have reached sort of the limit of our time. We really appreciate um, uh, Again, your, your participation, your willingness to serve. If you have any questions or need any support at all, um, please feel free to email uh, Destiny or me um, directly with those emails you see on the screen and be on the lookout for an email with links to the Google folder and resources that we have available to you to assist you with those interviews and focus groups. Again, thank you so, so very much. We do appreciate the time and the expertise um, from this group. Great meeting, thank you. Okay, thank you everybody.